Sometimes they do, and sometimes they can be really off, just looking at the data. Um, there's some charter schools like Richmond Charter Elementary Benito Juarez, where um, I believe there's only 2% of the school population is African American. And that's in contrast to 18% district wide. There's other instances as, as well where the, the um, data doesn't add up with the district data. When I was looking at their achievement scores, um, so, oh, okay. Okay. So overall, in the district, there's 50, it's 54 percent Hispanic Latino, 10 percent Asian, 18 percent African American, and looks like um, I don't see how many. There's a percentage, but I don't see what it is of um, of, of people who are identifying as two or more races. And then there's 10% of the people who didn't report their race. And that's a district-wide um, data. So if you look at the charter schools of the district, um, some of them reflect um, the overall district data. But there's just some sites where there's a huge percentage of Hispanic children and very few African-American children. That, and one of those schools is um, Rich, yeah, Richmond Charter Academy. Now, anecdotally, I've talked to some African American teachers who say that some of the African American parents they talk to are getting their applications denied. But I don't have any hard evidence of that. So, like, that's a question. Um, are, are they on purpose um, not accepting African American student applications, or is it just um, coincidental, or is it just, or does it reflect the population of that area, of that particular neighborhood? So those are questions, you know, are charter schools, in fact, resegregating or segregating students? Another uh, piece of information that I saw from our district, which was interesting, was the student performance data, comparing how the kids in the charter schools did with the kids overall in um, West Contra Costa Unified School District. And um, I'm sure not everybody has this. I probably should have made it a little bit a little bit better. Anyway, okay. Um, so overall, I'll just give you, it looks like um, the charter schools are, at most of the charter schools, they appear to be outperforming the district kids on the ELA test. But on the math test, the numbers are, the numbers are much closer. So from what I'm looking at, the overall achievement um, on the math test uh, in West Contra Costa Unified School District is around 25%. Um, if you look at the charter schools, the numbers are similar, 28%, 27% proficient, 21%, 28%, 30% at most of them. But then some of them are up as high as 41%. Um, where, where the charter schools appear to be outperforming the district schools is on the ELA test. They appear to have higher, um, higher profi percentage proficiency. But I come looking at this slide. Do you, you don't have it? Okay, it, it, just take a quick little a glance at that. Oh, it's right there in front of you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, just take a quick, quick glance at that. I want to make sure that you read that the it, or you read that the same way. I think I ran out. I'm sorry, I ran out of packets. The, so the orange bar is the math bar, and on, on the very end, you can, it, it might have gotten cut off, but the overall percentage for math proficiency in the district, I think, it's somewhere around. 12, 25%. Well, the overall proficiency for math in the, um, in the charter schools isn't that much higher, is my point. At most of the schools, it's around the same. But the ELA scores appear to be much higher. So, um, let's see. Um, also, overall, it appears as if the charter schools have less students who are, are, are have less special education students enrolled than the district average. And so that's some interesting information that, um, that, that I saw from, the, from Linda Delgado's um, report. Um, the, the ELA is English? Yeah, English language so arts. So we also don't know if there's a self-selection of students who go into charters. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 So, but whether or not, um, so there's a lot of, articles that have been written and studies that have been done about the performance of uh, charter school students versus public school students. But the bottom line is the, the principle, which is that charter schools are diverting public money into, into private hands. 
and they're not um, transparent. They're not um, they're not under the purview of the publicly elected school board. So that's that's kind of the the, the main um, point is that public money, taxpayer money, is ultimately being diverted into private hands. So, um, so the question, so one question I have is, what are the unions going to do about it? And the conclusion I've come to that unions might be part of the problem. Mm -hmm. that, that's just, um, uh, I, I think that um, as far as I've um, experienced, even though on one hand the United Teachers of Richmond passed a resolution against charter schools, it appears as if they're not really mobilizing or educating their members about, charter, about the threat of charter schools. Um, it also seems like the union is working closely with CTA, which has kind of a, a troubled past with charter schools, a troubled record with charter schools. Probably, that's why I didn't really want to be on film, because I think more of you know more about it than I do. But I know CTA has a connection with Proposition 39, for example. I believe that they kind of made a deal where they agreed to lower the amount of votes it would take to pass school bond measures, I think to two thirds. And I think in exchange, they, they, they allowed charter schools to have, was it first dibs on, on, on property, on, on the school properties? So, yeah. School bonds are 55%. So, so did they lower it to, to, from two thirds to 55%? And that's what Proposition 39 did? Okay. So I've heard that CTA had some involvement with, with the creation of Proposition 39 about CTA. Our union, for example, so the question is, are unions part of the problem or are they part of the solution when it comes to uh, pushing back against charter schools? Hey, Karen. Pull, pull up a chair. Uh, no. Um, so our, our union endorsed um, two... Uh, candidates for school board, two um, pro-public school anti-charter candidates. We, we endorsed Carlos Taboada and Mr. Phillips. Okay, so and that was done through our rep council and our executive board. Okay, so that's so that appears as if the union's doing the right thing. But then I noticed when I was going around with different um, community members um, to pass out flyers and put up uh, door hangers that there was a third name on the on the on the union materials and it was Elaine Merriweather. Now I like Elaine Merriweather. I, I know her to be a good educator. I know her to be a strong union advocate. But our union never voted to endorse Elaine Merriweather. So I was puzzled as to why she was on our flyer. Well I found out that CTA she's uh, told UTR to have her on the on our on our information and that's how she ended up there. Well, the problem is our union never voted to endorse a county school board uh, candidate. Our union never voted to endorse Elaine Merriweather. Well, the problem with that was Elaine Merriweather ended up taking votes away from one of the strongest anti-charter advocates we've seen in a long time on the county board, Pam Mirabella. So you had three people running for one seat, Pam, Elaine, and uh, Fatima. And actually, Elaine and Fatima are actually um, I'll just say in, a, in, a, in, a, in an organization together. That's not to say that they can't run against for the same seat, but they're in black women organized politically. Not that that means that they can't both run for the same seat, but I just thought it was puzzling that, that we would um, not support Pam Mirabella. Why didn't United Teachers of Richmond support Pam Mirabella? Why do we support Elaine Merriweather over Pam? And why would we support a candidate without the vote of our membership? Well, when I brought that up, I was just, you know, basically like, oh, Kristen's just a bitch. You know? <laughs> the answer. <laughs> she's, just, she's just complaining about nothing, really. I'm just crazed and, you know, a nut, really. So, <laughs> but, it just, but it just begs the question, um, and it goes back to this article that I was reading on Counterpunch called The Necessity for and Obstacles to Transforming the Unions into a Fighting Force for Workers. And one of the points in the article, it says, here are common techniques some unions officials employ. And these are um, unions which try to um, marginalize and disempower members. Some techniques they employ are um, endorsing political candidate, candidates without canvassing the members. Union, unions then make it difficult for members to find out how much money the union gives to politicians. Um, also, um, minutes of executive board meetings of local unions are not publicized to the membership. So rank and file members have no idea what their leadership is doing or how it is spending their money. 
If a union executive board passes a resolution, the resolution is not posted on the website, so no one finds out about it. And in fact, that's the case of UTR. Our resolution against charter schools was taken down from the UTR Facebook page, and instead, the um, NAACP resolution was put up. Also, our resolution has never been published in its complete form. Our resolution has an, another um, whereas that says that our, our union will, will um, conduct an education campaign to educate its members and the community about the threat of charter schools. But somehow that part got left off of our, our resolution. So back to the question, are unions a help or a hindrance in fighting charter schools? Last year at the NEA convention in Washington, D.C., um, I brought a resolution to the floor against charter schools. And the resolution was that, uh, you know, that the NEA cease referring to charter schools as public charter schools and um, begin to um, investigate the impact of charter schools on public schools. Well, um, one of the CTA, um, what do you call them? What do you call them? Big wigs? I don't know. What is it? <laughs> higher, higher ups in CTA, Terry Jackson, and I actually engaged in a five minute argument. She, she said that charter schools indeed were public schools. And I said, no, Terry, they're not. Just because they take public money doesn't make them public. And she said, yes, that's the definition of a public school. I said, they're not under the oversight of the publicly elected school board. They don't always follow ed code. They can pick and choose to a certain degree in certain cases who they want. Well, as it turned out, the California caucus uh, voted my resolution down, the whole 900-member California caucus. But fortunately, that wasn't the end of it. Um, when it got to the floor of the convention, it was sent to committee, along with a, a lot of other um, anti-charter resolutions. Basically, they were able to sidestep the charter um, conversation, and they really went big in on the transgender bathrooms and all that kind of stuff. But in Boston, they're not going to be able to avoid the charter school conversation. It, that, so that's, the NEA convention is, is one to watch this summer in Boston, because my resolution will be back up, and a dozen or so other um, charter school uh, efforts to reform charter schools. Back to the question, are unions a help or a hindrance? If you look at um, the CTA, um, the bills that they have proposed in um, the California State Legislature, um, they have a number of bills. They have three current ones. And so they do try to, um, in fact, um, get bills passed to reform charter schools. It does appear like CTA is doing that. I have a bunch of them on the table if you want to look at them. So it does appear that, that CTA is giving money towards this effort, and, and they do have lobbyists. But the problem, you guys already know what it is, right? Jerry Brown, he vetoes every single piece of the legislation that CTA puts out there. Um, so, I, and, I, and I would just say also that it appears too, like going back to our local, that um, ever since I started speaking out against charter schools, I don't know if this is coincidental, I feel like I have been under attack, not only at my school site, but just in the union more broadly. Um, and they keep trying to make it into a very per personal thing. Like I just have some kind of strange personality problem, and even that I'm a bully. Uh, but in reality, I think it's related to politics. But they don't want to make it political, they want to make it personal. So it always comes back to I'm just a, a bitch. Excuse me, Elizabeth. So that concludes my statement. So, the, but back to thinking are, charter, are, are, are unions a hindrance or a help? teachers who are not uh, accredited or go through state uh, uh, go through the state to become union uh, teachers uh, then the unions will cease to exist as long as they keep uh, bringing in TFA teachers because typically uh, these young teachers do not understand what unions are about nor do they care they just care about the benefits and uh, the higher wages they they receive if they get into the union but uh, we know, right? but, We've been fighting this for right, well, right, right. Years. So this, this Demetrio, this the president you have now, is a prime example of uh, what's happening to unions. He's dragging his feet on every union aspect there is. So uh, essentially, the union will collapse or implode because there's no support from within. Do is to put in the uh, to put in in context the uh, the charter school uh, drive, the charter school movement, and I think the. Uh, the correct way would be to, to, to frame it first with what's happened since November 8 here. So what, in my view, what happened in November 8 is that we had a, the ex, an extreme wing of the corporate class took over the reins of the empire. Now, this, uh, and that we, we know about Betsy DeVos, right, and her, her program, her, her penchant for uh, uh, vouchers and, char and, uh, and charter schools. Now, this didn't happen overnight. 
okay? The whole thing had been cooking since, well, to be more precise, since 1992 when the Charter School Act is passed, but more recently since the beginning of the Clinton years. The, uh, I mean, Bush with the No Child Left Behind, then the uh, uh, Race to the Top, and it all culminates with, the, uh, with this uh, charter school uh, drive to, it's, I see it as part of the Trump corporate agenda. It's a, a drive not to privatize, I would say, to corporatize education, or to use uh, the Speaker of the House, he, co he calls it uh, defederalizing. He spoke about, he introduced that new word, defederalizing, or the, um, the other one, the, yeah. the ideologue, uh, the family ideologue, <laughs> uh, Bannon, he talked about the deconstructing the administrative state. So this is part of that package, the presence of charter schools, the impulse they're getting in this new budget that uh, the, this, the man presented. He's, he's offering uh, four billion to charter schools and he's cutting nine billion from public education. And he had earlier promised 20 billion for, voucher, for the voucher charter drive. Now, I... Um, I, I would like to speak, to speak directly to a, a lot of issues have been mentioned, including the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the issue with the pensions, which I, I feel very close to my heart since I'm, I'm living off my pension. But I would like to focus on the, uh, on the document that, uh, that Steve just passed out, because I, I, I believe that it reflects a lot of the, the feeling, the, this, uh, the uh, platform, this, this one here, this one here. It reflects a great deal of the, uh, of the sentiment about charter schools, uh, lack of information, a certain naivete as to exactly what is going on. And uh, well, the one question that I failed to answer is, I mean, why? Why the, uh, why the drive to, uh, to take over the charter schools? I mean, why the drive to propose charter schools to give them this much money, this much uh, impulse? And, uh, I think the, 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 the reason is that the, for, for the first time in the history of uh, capitalist development, the, the schooling started to place, place now a very, very important role. Uh, I'll, I'll quote somebody here, the structural crisis of capital as a whole is reflected in the struggle over schooling. See which far from being incidental to the system, can be seen as lying at or near the core of the system, okay? And so th I, that's my explanation as to why this focus on education. I mean, couldn't, couldn't they find another way to make money, another institution to, to dismantle? And I think it's because of the crucial role of education in, in today's uh, advanced capitalism. Now. The, two, the arguments that I would like to address are the, is, uh, that, that I said, in my view, reflect a certain naivete, lack of knowledge, or just cynicism about what is going on. There, are the, the people, there is the argument that what we need to do, and this is, this is yeah, number four, what we need to do is make, make charter schools accountable, okay? If only the records were just public, accessible, just like the records of, of, uh, of uh, the public school system, and it will also end the, this uh, apparent racial segregation, you know. And I would like to argue that that's, uh, that's a red herring. That is not the real argument. Uh, so I would say, so what if today charter school records are accountable? In fact, you can get all the, practically all the records that you want. They're just not accessible. Okay, they're not easy to get. But what if they were as accessible as the, as the public schools? And what if they had the politically correct distribution of uh, ethnic groups? I would say, well, so what? So what? They are still charter schools. They are still siphoning, by my own conservative estimate, by my own conservative estimate, just on average daily attendance this year, $32 million. And on their operating day-to-day -day, uh, teacher, uh, what do you call it, professional development, salaries and compensations, everything else, it amounts to uh, 36 million. So that's a total conservative estimate of $68 million annually this year, this year that they're gonna get. 
this year, 68 million of our dollars, tax generated revenue. Okay, tax generated revenue. Yeah. That's in Richmond. In Richmond. Richmond. Yeah, no, in, in West Contra Costa, just in West Contra Costa. No, in, in, in LA, it's 500 million a year. It's 500 million a year. Just, just, just in our district, 68, 68 million dollars. So I think my, my, what I would propose, and the only position that I will defend is an immediate moratorium on charters, just like the, the teachers of uh, UTR uh, resolved to do a year and a half ago, an immediate moratorium on charters just for starters. At the same time that we move toward, uh, uh, I forgot the, the, the word, to wiping out, eradicating, repealing, repealing Proposition 39, because the district is bankrupting itself. Okay, this is a, 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 from the economic, from a just an orthodox economic point of view, it's, an, it's a wasteful duplication of services. Wasteful duplication of services. Have some records here, and, and, and I think that the, we should not overlook the, that the, our district, since it, it was evident to everyone that cared to look since 2011, is in a state of academic bankruptcy. And that's the issue that everybody seems to side skirt, don't want to look at it, but we are in a state of academic bankruptcy. And that is why the charter schools have made such, with such ease, such inroads in, in, our, in our district. There is no, no compromise possible to say that all we want is for them to be accountable, to say that all we want for them is, is to be you know, ethnically correct is not enough. It may be a necessary step, but it's not, as, it's not sufficient. It's not sufficient. They, they are here to stay. And they, are, they are like a guest that came, and you offered the guest the couch, and they, they are now in the, in the master bedroom. That's what it amounts to. The, we, we cannot go on like this. Financially, the district will be reduced to the, a, a rump of a district very soon, very soon. Things cannot go on like that. And, and, and well, that's that basically. So, oh, and and the other argument that, that I would that very few people have presented, I think, is that charter schools are fundamentally not anti-democratic. I mean, anti-democratic is someone that more or less pays lip service to democracy and occasionally does something that is anti-democratic. They are contra-democratic. They are the exact polar opposite of what democracy should look like. And I think that that's a, a fundamental value in, in this society. And that has been one of the fundamental values underlying our system of public education since its beginning. And there are some uh, former slaves, I forget the name, Best or Best, well, the man, one of the, in, in, in the Carolinas, one of the founders of the public school system in the, I forget it's North or South Carolina, but it is democracy. It is democracy. It is the basic idea that people that are, that are affected by decisions that are taken should take part in, in the making of those decisions. And education is not like, I mean, you don't go, uh, you, you don't send your, your kid to, to, uh, to a school the way you send him to the supermarket to buy a soda or something. I mean, you, you, you need to trust the, the, the institution, you need to trust the teacher, you need to trust the community. And, and this approach that the charters have is an approach that atomizes society. And what I suspect is behind this debate is not really whether they are public or they are not public. I think that what, what we are fighting for here is a, a different concept, a different definition of what the common is, what is, what is the public. Is it defined by the market uh, template, you know, that, or is it defined by the, a fundamental respect for democracy, for our democratic institutions? That's what is at stake. The, and as to the question whether they, they are public or they are not, they are not public. I mean, the, the pharmaceutical industry gets subsidies, you know, in the, I don't know, 80% for the R&D, and they are not public. Uh, lots of institutions uh, get, get money from the government and they are not public institutions. I think what, what defines a public institution as a public institution is the fact that it, it is democratically governed. I'm Mary Flanagan at Nystrom. 
elementary school, a uh, member of UTR, site rep. And uh, Nystrom Elementary has two charter schools on either side of us at this point. The one has been there for 11 years, uh, Richmond College Prep, that was funded with, now I should know because I've talked about it so many times, but about 68 million, 80 something million from a class action lawsuit that was file, fi, uh, filed and won against a, a Chevron subsidiary, the plastics factory that's over there on um, cutting, not far from the school, uh, less than a mile. And uh, the, the lawyer took the money and uh, it, he had to spend it on behalf of the class action representatives, the people who were file, filing the lawsuit. And he started a charter. There's many things he could have done with that. But he started a charter right smack next to Nystrom. And that charter, I've been at Nystrom 11 years, and uh, there's teachers who have been there that long, five or six of us. We've seen the kids systematically cherry-picked from our classes when, in October or September when they decide they have more room or they've eliminated who they wanted to, they would pick our top kids, not our very top necessarily, but in the top four or five kids in the class, always. Uh, and uh, we also had kids bounce back constantly, uh, mostly African-American kids, mostly boys, behavior problems. They would not take kids who couldn't speak English. The only uh, special ed that they had for the kids was speech, and so, if a kid couldn't learn to read or wasn't scoring high enough on the test, they would send, they would counsel them back to Nystrom. And I won't even go into Nystrom's problem assessing the children uh, who seem to have disabilities. We're very uh, non-compliant, I think. But anyway, with the American Disabilities Act, whatever. Uh, so, so that's been going on for 11 years. It, the, the, School has pretty much stabilized, but they won an award for having the best scores in an elementary school in the district. Yes, because they called our students. They figured out they have a lot of African-American students more than any other charter school by far, uh, but they were very carefully to cherry pick our kids. And that's not to say Nystrom doesn't have brilliant kids. Uh, we do have brilliant kids. But we have large class size, we have a turnover of teachers, we have kids who are struggling with poverty. We were choked uh, with, um, you know, new teachers teaching kindergarten and first grade and 28 kids in the class. And yeah, we have problems uh, educating our kids, especially the English language learners, 70% of the families, I think, or maybe it's 50. Anyway. I'm I forget, our um, uh, learning English. So the parents are learning English. But on the other side of us is um, the RCA, Richmond Charter Academy, that just, just started up. And it is entirely Latino. Uh, they claim they're less than 1% African American, but there is no African American parent, teacher, or kid that we see over there. It's right on the other side of the cyclone fence. It is incredibly insulting to our kids that there's a school that's just for Latino kids and that has, uh, there was something called Building Blocks for Kids, which was a pseudo kind of turf, what do you call it, turf grass, fake grassroots that, uh, yeah, signed up a lot of parents for the charters. Um, and a lot of it is uh, the, uh, the middle school kids uh, because middle school is difficult, but also it, it, it the appeal was a racist pitch, I think, that uh, these organizers made to the parents. Um, so the school board just approved their charter, even though parents complained about discipline uh, the, and their amazing segregation in a neighborhood that is not segregated. It, it, there's plenty of African American kids. They they renewed that charter. I want to bring to uh, your attention three bills from CTA, good strong bills that they're endorsing from three different legislators. 
And uh, for a long time, uh, we have been trying to push CTA from within and without uh, to deal with the charters. And um, these are uh, three bills. They make the charters less easy to approve. Uh, they insist charters can't turn away students. They have to educate everybody, English language <coughs> students, special ed students, uh, difficult behavior issue students, etc. And they make ch charter school operations accountable and transparent. Uh, they have three different authors, and uh, this is the best thing that I've seen to come out of CTA for a long time. I emailed it to a lot of people last night, but I, I'm afraid I didn't email it to everybody. So this has just come out. And my, my mess, and there's, a, okay, the second thing I want to bring to your attention is this thing from um, uh, J4J, uh, the journey for, oh, what the heck? Justice. Justice, journey for justice, thank you. Uh, and uh, the We Choose campaign that was on your website, Ardo. Um, and that was, that's fabulous. That's come out of Oakland. That's Mike Hatchinson, who ran for school board, had tremendous support from OEA, uh, the Oakland Union of Teachers. And um, he lost because the charters poured money, as usual, into their school board races. I believe he lost. But, um, uh, and it's a moratorium on school privatization. It's the first one. Uh, the uh, N0 tolerance pro policies, stop the attack on black teachers, and state takeovers of a, and uh, appointed school boards and mayoral control, and eliminate over-reliance on standardized tests. Those are the ones that really ring with me. My point is that there's excellent organizations. The Network for Public Education, um, Diane Ravitch's uh, group is nationwide, and uh, we need to get together with everybody. Uh, of course, NAACP, that was so fabulous making, uh, promoting that moratorium on charter schools. Um, so, that, I guess that's the gist of it, especially in the face of Trump. No, I just want to say that it, it's occurred to people how right-wing and Republican the charter voucher agenda is uh, because of DeVos, and I think, uh, you know, we don't have a lot of time, really, if he puts in a, anyway, it's urgent for us all to get together and push back. And I just read this thing. This sounds like my campaign literature. I don't see what's wrong with it. And they also say, I am not a Demetrio supporter, but it also, it says, uh, uh, new charter schools should not be approved, okay, without ensuring accountability, I see. Okay, they should not be approved is what we're saying. So, uh, so yeah, this is typical Demetrio to do half half a measure and put pawn it off as a full measure. And yes, he is working with um, the Eli Broad superintendent. Eli Broad trained. Eli Broad uh, led the school the training the program, and then came to our district. California, to the number of charters per district, and I think it's ten. Now it just ha so happens that. We can have like the Benito Juarez Elementary, the uh, Leadership Public School, and the Richmond Charter Academy. They are part of the same. They are part of the A method. Mm -hmm. So they, I think they count those as one, because mm -hmm. it's, it's one franchise and we, with three charters in our district. But the Charter School Act does mention the number 10. It has a provision where how you can get out of that number 10, increase it, but it is a bit complicated, but there is a number 10 limit. And the other point was that, that the Teach for America and the use of computers has a reason. I mean, it has a very important impact on, on, on our profession because they are de-skilling our profession. I mean, don't forget that at Teach for America, you prepare Teach for America teachers in six months, you know, a really quickie, quickie thing. And you don't need a really qualified teacher, you know, with two years of college work just to teach when you have a room full of computers yeah, and kids right. that just sit down and I'll turn it on for you and just do your work. That, that's what they do. 